This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so we have gathered as the family of God at St. Paul's United Church of Christ, or we have gathered from our homes or wherever we may be traveling across God's good earth for this time of worship. In this past week, I sent out an email blast simply entitled Mission and Ministry. We are so much about that at St. Paul's United Church of Christ and as the Church of Jesus Christ, the Church Alive. There are so many things that are before us. I'm not going to go into details, but please remember that today we lift up our Neighbors in Need offering a special UCC mission offering. Maybe commit to being a part of that this year, other than actually physically bringing offering. We also have that online giving opportunity now that has made, been made possible again by our technology folks. There are others that have followed suit, not wanting to leave mission behind because we can't gather in person and doing virtually everything we possibly can to keep the word of God out there and to keep raising funds for those in need. And so this year, the crop walk is also going virtually. Please watch for more emails, check out our website, Facebook. There are postings just guiding you through the new process. And let me just say one other thing, and that is chicken pot pie. 
You know it's coming, folks, wherever you may be this morning, may, wherever you may be throughout the next couple weeks, watch for details. Ordering details are coming, the cost, what is available, when it's available to be ordered, when it's available to be picked up. All I know is that chicken pot pie can be frozen very well. So don't hold, hold back and just order a quart, quart or two. You might want to order in larger numbers. Three is my favorite number anyway. It's very Trinitarian. So please think about that as you watch for those details coming on the chicken pot pie supper. We celebrate World Communion Sunday, recognizing that our brothers and sisters around the world that are believers of Jesus Christ Maybe they've already broken bread and poured the cup, and maybe they will later um, as we go through this celebration of our Lord and Savior and what he did for each and every one of us. Whether we find ourselves as citizens of the United States of America or whether we find ourselves on continents across the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, God is good, and God sent his Son for each and every one of us. There is more to celebrate today, and I am delighted that Nancy and I have this opportunity to share in this leadership time as we begin our in-person worship together in the sanctuary. And so we just pause for a moment as we switch speakers, and Sam has an opportunity to uh, switch microphones and Nancy will share with us more about what is coming on this joyous Sunday at St. Paul's. Today we are celebrating Welcome Sunday. And just like everything else since March, things look a little bit different this year. Welcome Sunday is typically when we kick off the start of our Sunday school year. And thanks to the coronavirus, Sunday school is going to take place a lot differently. After serving the Sunday school teachers and all the families and individuals who regularly attend Sunday school, we have made the decision that it's going to be safest for everyone to start Sunday school at home virtually this year. So children and families and individuals have all received different emails letting them know what the offerings are for their Sunday school opportunities and they've already been cued into it this morning or even last night. Today we will also be bringing back our children's chats to the worship service and I have measured six feet distancing on the carpet up front, so when it's time, the children that are here are invited to come down and find a blue X on the carpet. Um, keep your mask on so we stay safe. I'm gonna keep my mask on. Trudy and I both feel that being this far up here, we're safe from you without masks on, but the little bit closer that we'll be down front for Children's Chat, we'll be wearing masks. Now I invite you to turn your hearts and your minds I'm getting a signal from Preston. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> As we said, we're going to be flexible during this time. I'm not used to speaking from the pulpit. At this time, I ask you to concentrate your hearts and minds on our worship this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Today, we gather around God's table from near and far. We are the people of God. Though we differ in language, custom, and tradition, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. For there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We are one in God's Spirit. We are one, and together we remember our Lord Jesus. For we are the people of redemption. He gave himself up for us so we could be reconciled to God. Come, let us worship. Christ is with us. Christ is in our midst. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we rise to meet each new day, please let us be filled with your spirit. Wherever we go, let us spread love, joy, peace, goodness, and faithfulness. Let us desire to become more like you and to worship you in all we do. Help us desire these things so much more than the sin that entices us. Thank you for always going before us. In Jesus' name, amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie 
and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let us confess our sins to God, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. O Lord, that we dare confess anything at all to you before our brothers and sisters here in this church today is proof that we believe that you already know us as we are, that we believe that you are able to do something about it, and that we are willing to step from our worlds of pretense, fantasy, and illusion into a kind of facing up to things as they are, where you can touch us and forgive us and love us, and accept us, and make us new. This is hard, Lord, but here we are. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, from wherever you are gathering for this time of worship this day, know that this statement is completely reliable and should be universally accepted. Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and be alive to all that is good God's mercy never ends. I tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. It is so good to see my friends here. All those months of staring at this camera eye, just staring at me as I gave the children's chat. I was kind of intimidating, so it's so much better to look at your faces and see the smiling eyes behind those masks. I brought something to show you. Does anybody know what this is? What do you think, Faith? It's a Happy Meal from McDonald's. Raise your hand if you have ever gotten a Happy Meal from McDonald's before. Okay. Now, what's your favorite thing about a Happy Meal? What do you like the best? Simon? The food. The food. How about you, Faith? What do you like? The prize, the toy inside. Mm -hmm. Does Happy like the toys to come inside too? Yeah. I bet if we were surveying 100 children in America, they would say that the favorite thing about the Happy Meal is the prize that comes inside. So why don't we take a look at what the toy was in this Happy Meal? is a little dinosaur. Now, I have to be honest with you. I'm not too happy about this toy. First of all, it's a little cheap looking. I'm not sure it's going to last very long. But even if it does last, it really doesn't do too much. I mean, if I push the tail, you can see the dinosaur's head moves up and down. But that's all you can do with it. I know it's not going to keep me occupied very long. It's probably not going to keep most children occupied or entertained or happy for very long. I will admit, I was pretty happy with the french fries that came inside, Simon. And as yummy as they were, even when they were gone, I wasn't satisfied. I wanted more. And that's kind of how it is with a happy meal from McDonald's. The happiness just doesn't last. But today, 
I want to talk to you about something that happens at church. It does have a lasting effect. Did you know that we have a happy meal of sorts right here in church? No, you probably didn't. You have any clue what that happy meal might be that I'm talking about? We are going to have something called communion later on this Sunday. And this is what our Happy Meal communion is going to look like this morning. It's a little bit different from how we used to do communion, where they pass trays of bread and trays of cups of juice or wine. But it's kind of neat, and I thought it tied in real neat that the Happy Meal has such special packaging. And our communion cup this morning kind of has special packaging too. So when you open up the packaging, the first layer reveals this wafer. And normally we have a little piece of bread and we pass the trays. But this wafer is supposed to be like the bread we normally eat. And then there's a little cup of juice, which actually doesn't look too different from the cups of juice we usually have. And you might have heard Pastor Trudy say earlier, today is World Communion Sunday. And that means that Christians all around the planet, all around the planet Earth, are going to participate in communion. Depending on where they are in the different time zones, they may have already taken communion, or they may still take communion later on in the worship service. And we've got our friends at home watching, they're going to take their communion at home, we're going to participate in communion later on in the worship service too. Now this wafer, with this little piece of bread, this is supposed to represent Jesus' body. And the little cup of juice represents Jesus' blood. And that's from when Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday. And like Pastor Trudy said, when we participate in communion and we eat the bread and we drink the juice, we remember the wonderful sacrifice that Jesus did. He died on the cross taking our sins onto him so that we could be forgiven for those sins. And then we are happy because we receive, each and every one of us can receive eternal life if we believe in him. Now that is something that I think we can be happy about. Now communion and Jesus dying on the cross and taking away our sins is kind of confusing. So I found a little poem that might help you understand the meaning of our little communion happy meal that I want to share with you now. It's called the Savior's Happy Meal. This happy meal doesn't look like much and it doesn't come with a toy. It may not fill my stomach, but it fills my heart with joy. The bread and juice remind me of the Savior's love for me when he died upon the rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. There is no way I can describe the gratitude I feel each and every time I eat the Savior's happy meal. Will you pray with me, please? And we're going to do what we used to do six months ago where we repeat what I said. Dear God, Thank you for Jesus' death, death and resurrection. Thank you also for the happy meal we will eat today as a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Romans chapter 8. Verses 18 to 39. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the fir first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. 
Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among the many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. More than conquerors. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So as I said, it's Welcome Sunday. Well, sort of. It's as close to a Welcome Sunday service as we're going to get. Couldn't invite the Sunday school teachers to be up and down and out of their seats. We're not going to be celebrating the Welcome Sunday service the way we used to, with worship service down in Fellowship Hall, with our children in attendance with their families, followed by a delicious pancake breakfast. But we're celebrating it nonetheless. I welcome you back to worshiping in our beautiful sanctuary. Even if we are wearing masks and we're social distancing, we are back. And as I said, today starts off our virtual Sunday school program. So our families are at home with educational opportunities available to them so that they can continue to learn about our loving God and our Savior. Returning to the sanctuary for worship and the startup of Sunday school means that we are back to a more intentional focus on God. But do you know what? God never left. He's been here all this time. God is always present and he always welcomes us. He says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. We are all God's children, no matter how old or young we are and God welcomes each and every one of us. He also says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and they with me. Such fitting words on this World Communion Sunday. Since the onslaught of the coronavirus and its impact on our communities and our everyday lives, things have been upended and we have been shaken from our comfort zones. We've probably realized this before, but the pandemic strongly reminds us that this world we live in is a place of constant change. The August 14th devotion of Jesus Calling reminds us that despite the changes we experience, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will always be by our side. That's comfort for all of us. 
We are well aware, especially as Pastor Trudy continually updates us about prayer needs within our faith community, that despite the coronavirus, normal illnesses, diseases, cancer, and death continue to afflict us and our loved ones. While these issues are never welcomed or desired, their occurrence during the pandemic has seemed especially cruel. Safety measures and COVID precautions have often prevented families from being together during a health crisis or from mourning together after a death. But hopefully some comfort can be found in the promises from God in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, which says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mark Altrog, senior pastor of Grace Church in Indiana, Pennsylvania, stated in a blog, everything that God does in our lives is for our benefit, including suffering. Though they never seem pleasant at the time, hard times produce wonderful benefits in our lives. And he goes on to outline eight benefits of suffering. He tells us that suffering drives us to God's word. It brings us to God in prayer. It humbles us. It makes us rely on Christ's power. It brings us the comfort of God himself. It gives us compassion for others. It produces patience and endurance. And finally, it reminds us that this world that we're living in is not our eternal home. While a trial may make us uncomfortable, it is a humbling experience we realize that we're not invincible. We are fragile people in need of a savior. Experiencing a trial may provide a little perspective for us and help us to appreciate the life we had before the trial came into our lives. While a trial may make us uncomfortable, it also helps us realize how much worse someone else's life might be, giving us compassion for others and what they're going through. Times of trial may deplete our energies and zap us of our strength, but they are also reminders that we need the strength that Jesus Christ can provide, which enables us to do all things. In a world of instant gratification and quick fixes, sometimes a trial may be just what we need to develop some much needed patience and endurance. Romans 8.28 is a very familiar and much quoted verse, especially when people are experiencing difficulties. It tells us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. People sometimes interpret this verse to mean that God will take away the bad thing that is happening, or that God will change the bad thing into something good right here on earth. When families have a loved one who is very, very sick, they may hang all their hopes on that verse. And then if their loved one passes away, they may experience anger. But what they and we need to realize in an instance like that is that God did work things together for good. The good that resulted is that their loved one has gone home to their eternal home where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I love how author Jonathan Kahn explains the Romans 8.28 passage in his book, The Book of Mysteries. I'd like to share that with you this morning. He says, imagine you had to make your way across a valley to get to a mountain as fast as you could. But the valley is filled with soldiers, half of them dressed in white and half in black. As you try to make your way across the valley, you discover the soldiers in white are there to help you get across the valley to the opposite side of the mountain as fast as you can. But you soon discover that the soldiers in black are there for the opposite purpose. They battle the soldiers in white, resisting every step of advance. Finally, after a long and arduous battle, you make it across to the base of the mountain on the other side. The battle is over. It is then that you notice a strange thing. The soldiers in black begin removing their outer garments to reveal garments of white underneath. The soldiers in black were really soldiers in white. The soldiers were all on the same side. 
And the ultimate goal wasn't to bring you to the other side as fast as possible, but to get you there at the exact right time. And for that to happen, both the soldiers in white and the soldiers in black had to fulfill their mission. And though it looked like war, both sides were actually working together for your good. Khan goes on to explain, and so it is written in the book of Romans, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So if you love God and you belong to him, he will work all things in your life together for good. The good and the evil, the beautiful and the ugly, the joyous and the sorrowful, the problems and the triumphs, all for your blessing and good. For the child of God, there are only two realities, blessings and blessings in disguise. Sometimes the blessings are very well disguised, but they remain blessings nevertheless. Hold on to this and learn to see and believe through the disguises. And remember, it only looks like a battlefield, but in the end, you will see it as it always was a field of blessings where your darkest enemies, your greatest adversaries, were in the end your blessings in disguise. So whether it is drugs, divorce, abuse, cancer, coronavirus, or death, God is with us in it all. Whether he causes it or he allows it to happen, we really don't know, he will use it for his purpose. We just need to go to him with it, no matter what it is. His greatest desire is for each and every one of us to have a relationship with him. He could very easily speak and put an end to all sickness, pain, and suffering. But perhaps he allows it so that we will realize our need for him. He could send Jesus back to earth to take all the faithful home to heaven with him and then have it out with Satan once and for all. But because God is all-loving and ever-patient, he is waiting to give everyone the opportunity to come to faith in him. He is waiting to rescue that one lost sheep and celebrate when the prodigal child returns home. I want you to know that God is with us on every step of the way through this life's journey, through times of trial and through times of good. The afflictions we face are just gentle nudges pointing us back to him. God is in control. He knows the number of our days. He even knows the number of hairs on our heads. He encourages us to draw close to him in prayer, praise, and worship. He invites us to look to him for strength and comfort. And one day he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, when he welcomes us home to heaven with him. I'd like to close by sharing the August 16th devotion from 365 Devotions for a Thankful Heart, which was entitled, No What Ifs. And it began with this scripture verse from Psalm 97, verse one, which says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. The psalmist summed it up, the Lord reigns. Today, we might say it this way, God is sovereign over all. This truth gives us many reasons to be thankful. God reigns. Nothing is random in this world. No evil we witness is beyond his control or his redemption. He as king allows rulers to assume those positions. He is writing his salvation story into the history of the human race, but he nevertheless calls us to pray and heeds our prayers. We can also be thankful that God's sovereignty is a matter of black and white. There is no gray or there would be no sovereignty. This means we can choose to trust him rather than worry about the what ifs. We can find peace in the truth that our all good, all wise, all powerful God is in charge of every situation that concerns us. And we can rest in the trust that things beyond our control pretty much everything, are well within his control. Now consider the circumstances of your life. Say out loud, the Lord reigns, and praise God. I praise you, my King, and thank you for the peace that I experience 
because I know you are sovereign. Amen. God is with us, not just when everything seems clear and times are good, but also when we struggle with questions and doubt. When we cry out to God, our prayers are heard. When the world cries out to God, we are part of God's answer, offering water in the desert, offering nourishment to a world that is spiritually hungry. Our gifts we offer are our answer to God's own goodness. Would you please join me in the prayer of dedication? We offer our gifts to you, Lord, with grateful, cheerful hearts. Thank you that you meet our needs on the journey, providing what we need when we need it. Trusting you, we can share what we have with others. And when we do this joyfully, together, today, in Jesus' name, amen. Before going into the formal invitation to the celebration of our sacrament of Holy Communion, I just want to remind each and every one of us again how our church has grown, and that we not only gather in person this morning, but we have the family of God, the church, that will be gathering maybe this morning, maybe this afternoon or this evening, or maybe another day throughout the week when the opportunity is given to take a Sabbath. But whenever, wherever the bread is broken and the cup is lifted in his name, we are communing together and we are sharing in this holy sacrament that he has given us. Because some of us have gathered in person, and because there will be the sharing from the celebration cup of taking of the wafer and the juice, recognizing that we are responsible to each other, you are welcome to share in this sacrament this morning. If you feel comfortable removing your mask for those few moments to partake the wafer and the cup. And if not, you are welcome to take that celebration cup with you and celebrate with that wafer and that juice in the comfort of your home. And again, God will be with you. God is sovereign over us. And it is a happy meal. We don't approach this meal somber and heavy laden. We rejoice because of what Jesus Christ did for us and the representation and the remembrance of him that is ours in this meal. So again, as the Spirit leads you, as you are comfortable, when we come to that time, we will pause and Nathan will play music for us, a communion hymn, a communion selection of what he, that he has made, but then you make the choice. If you take this moment to commune here and now, or like our virtual brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe at another time. Christ invites us all to this holy feast. As we gather today, we remember our sisters and brothers from above and below the equator, from the north and from down under, from every time zone around the globe. As today's sunlight inches across land and sea, Christians gather to celebrate their place in God's family. All are invited. All are welcome. Let us pray together. Loving and gracious God who surrounds creation with abundant love, we give thanks and blessings to you. We bless you for your love made known to us through Jesus, which reassures and reconciles us to you, to ourselves, and to one another. As Christ is our light to you, may we be lights to others, illuminating the path toward communion with you, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, our friend and brother. 
In Jesus' name, we continue to pray as one saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us share together in our responsive blessing of these holy elements. God, may this bread connect us more closely with you and with our neighbors near and far. Bless this bread and we pray. May this fruit of the vine remind us of the interconnectedness of people around the world. Bless this cup we pray. May this simple meal bring us into union with you, your people, and your world united in the one body of Christ. You are invited as you choose to do to commune in this time, in this place. When you gather from your virtual setting, if you don't have the celebration cup, know that God is with you as you share in the eating of your bread, your wafer, your cracker, wherever you may be. Know that he is there, that he has given his body for you and the juice that you select, that his blood was poured out for you. Let us commune. Let us offer to God our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. With thanksgiving, let us celebrate our new life in Christ, giving thanks to God, our creator and sustainer. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this holy meal. Thank you for Jesus and his all-inclusive love for humanity. Thank you for this day which we worship and serve you. Amen. And the blessing I'm going to share with you today is actually the lyrics to a very familiar choral benediction which our choir normally sings to us. Go now in love and peace. Maybe you can picture or hear the music in your heads as I read the words. Go now in love, go now in peace. Serve the Lord in all you do. Follow the way of the Lord till we meet again. May God's love guide and protect you, surround you in all you do. May peace be within you till we meet again. Go now in love, go now in peace. Serve the Lord in all you do. Follow the way of the Lord. Go in love. Go in peace. Amen.